Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're covering the Battle of Fort Donelson, located in Stewart County, Tennessee, on February 12th through the 16th, 1862. Fort Donelson proved to be the largest battle in the Civil War up to this point, situated in an area that watched over a key position in the center of the Confederate defense of Tennessee. The Union forces, aligned under what was referred to as the Army of Tennessee, consisted of three divisions commanded by Brigadier Generals McClernand, C.F. Smith, and Lew Wallace. Additionally, two regiments of cavalry and eight batteries of artillery were assigned to support the infantry divisions. The combined forces numbered about 25,000 men in total, with 15,000 of those men available at the beginning of February. The overall command was by General Grant. In addition, the Western Gunboat Flotilla under Flag Officer Andrew H. Foote from the Fort Henry battle consisted of four ironclad gunboats, the USS St. Louis, Carondelet, Louisville, and Pittsburgh along with three more timber-clad gunboats. The Confederate forces opposing them were three divisions from the Army of Central Kentucky. They comprised of 17,000 men commanded by Brigadier Generals John B. Floyd, Bushrod Johnson, and Simon Bolivar Buckner. In addition, the Confederates controlled Fort Donelson, which was named after Brigadier General Daniel S. Donelson, who had selected the site and began construction in 1861. Fort Donelson rose about 100 feet in the air on approximately 100 acres of dry ground above the Cumberland River, which allowed it plunging fire against the attacking gunboats, an advantage Fort Henry did not enjoy. The river batteries included 10 32-pounder smoothbore cannons, two 9-pounder smoothbore cannons. In addition, they had an 8-inch howitzer and a 10-inch columbiad. There were three miles of trenches in a semicircle around the fort completing the defenses. On February 12th, Grant started the attack by encircling the fort with his 15,000 men. The Confederate Army was surprised by this bold move, but believed they were safe and allowed the Union Army to almost completely encircle them without any serious challenge. When Grant's army arrived, the Confederate General Johnston, the overall commander of the Confederate forces in the area, ordered General Floyd to leave his position in Clarksville and to move the remaining troops that he had to the defense of Fort Donelson. The day of the 13th was mostly small skirmishes as Union commanders ignored Grant's order and conducted operations against the Confederates. After several different skirmishes, the end result of the day was General Floyd linking up with Fort Donelson and the Union being repulsed from their attempt to stretch across the field to the water. Up to this point, the weather had been mostly rainy, but the night of February 13th resulted in strong winds and temperatures dropping down to the lower teens and depositing more than three inches of snow. This resulted in artillery and wagons frozen to the earth. However, even with these temperatures, neither side could light heating or cooking fires for fear of enemy snipers. It was at the same time that General Floyd held a meeting with his commanders and they decided they wouldn't be able to hold the fort. They directed General Pillow, a sub-commander for General Floyd, to lead the breakout and attempt to reach Nashville. During the preparations, however, as Pillow looked over his troop, he had one of his aides killed in front of him by sniper fire. Contrary to his normal aggressive behavior, Pillow decided they had been detected and to postpone the escape attempt. The day of the 14th arrived and began with a naval battle. Foote's flotilla had arrived during the afternoon along with 10,000 more reinforcements, bringing Grant's total up to 25,000 troops. This provided enough troops to extend Union all the way to the river, thus cutting off the fort. After the troops had been unloaded, Grant urged Flag Officer Foote to attack the Fort River's batteries. Foote was reluctant to do this without adequate reconnaissance. However, he did end up attacking just as he had done at Fort Henry. He closed the distances far closer than needed. Unfortunately, unlike Fort Henry, the Confederate cannon waited until the gunboats were closer this time. The Confederates pounded the flotilla, wounding foot, destroying the wheelhouse of the St. Louis and forcing it to float back down the river. The Louisville was disabled and the Pittsburgh began to sink. This result made Grant realize that he'd have to take the fort by foot. Even with their victory over the naval flotilla, the Confederate commanders doubted their chances and held several meetings. They decided they'd make their escape attempt the next morning. At the dawn of the 15th, the Confederates made their move. The Union was not surprised completely as it was too cold that the troops could not sleep. Unfortunately, while the troops may not have been surprised, their commander, General Grant, was caught flat-footed. He'd already left the area and had headed down with the flotilla downriver. He left strict orders with the Union generals to not initiate an engagement, and he left no second-in-command to issue orders in case something happened. This meant that the Union did not move forces to intercept the Confederate troops. 
leaving only a smaller Union force in the way of those Confederate troops to defend against the attack themselves. The Union brigades of Colonels Richards Oglesby and John MacArthur were hit the worst, and they quickly withdrew by 8.30 that morning. McLaren, the overall Union commander of that area, requested help from the other two Union generals, but was denied by both because they didn't have order to engage. In desperation, General Wall sent an aide to find General Grant to get orders. While this happened, General McLaren's troops were running out of ammo. The Confederates, however, did not take advantage of the situation. They cautiously attempted to make their way out of the encirclement, and because they proceeded so slowly, their attack ended around noon when the other Union generals decided to not wait for Grant and instead move forward to stop the Confederates. The Unions did stop the escape attempt, but they were pushed back about a mile, leaving a small opening for Confederates. Later that afternoon, Grant returned and ordered a full counterattack, trying to seal off the Confederates. For reasons not specifically known, General Pillow took his Confederate soldiers, and instead of pushing through that hole to escape, they withdrew back to the fort, surrendering the gains they had made earlier in the day. About 1,000 soldiers had died on each side, and another 2,500 wounded lay in the snow as night fell. The Confederate command argued over the situation, although all admitted that it looked like it was failing. General Floyd was worried that he'd be indicted for corruption during his service as Secretary of War in President James Buchanan's cabinet if he was captured. He promptly turned his command over the General Pillow and ran. He escaped downriver by a small boat. That next morning, General Pillow was afraid of the same situation and turned overall command to General Buckner, who agreed that he would actually surrender to the rest of his troops while the rest of the command ran away. This is when Buckner asked General Grant to negotiate terms of surrender. Grant responded that no terms accepting unconditional immediate surrender can be accepted. Buckner declared these terms were ungenerous and unchivalrous, but he accepted the situation anyways. The losses for this battle were the largest so far. The Union suffered 2,832 casualties, and the Confederates lost 2,000 infantry, but an additional 15,000 men as prisoners of war. The clear victors of the Union forces forcing the Confederacy to lose needed supplies and forced them out of much of Kentucky and Tennessee. Thank you for listening, and join us next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.